Welcome back to Precision Riflecraft and thank you for joining me. When we think of precision rifle shooting, we tend to immediately conflate it with long range shooting, but those are really two separate issues altogether. There's an entire profession of incredibly skilled riflemen whose average range of engagement is just 47 meters or 51 yards. Of course, I'm talking about police snipers working in SWAT teams or emergency response teams or ERTs as they're known here in Canada. And these guys really have an incredible skill set that differs uh, quite a bit from their military counterparts. Those guys have an average range of engagement, at least in the United States, between 600 and 1200 meters. And uh, they have set world records. As a matter of fact, the world record in sniping, as of this video at least, was set by a Canadian at an incredible 3540 meters. Uh, he's an unnamed uh, operator in JTF2, Joint Task Force 2, which is a special forces unit here in Canada and three of the five longest sniping engagements on record were set by Canadians. So uh, we Canadian riflemen, including those uh, guys like me who are civilians, are quite proud of that. We have quite a pedigree here. But there are some fundamental differences between police and military snipers, and we're going to discuss them a little bit before bringing out a very special guest I'm really excited to introduce to you. Before we do, as I say, we're going to talk a little bit about how these two disciplines uh, differ from one another. And uh, to me, the fundamental difference is that police uh, snipers, they can't miss. We tend to think of uh, military snipers as uh, operating with an extremely high level of precision. And obviously that is often true given uh, the, the records that have been set, um, given the distances that they are engaging uh, targets. Um, but all of those records that we talk about, certainly that world record uh, over three and a half kilometers, uh, you know, those aren't first round cold bore hits, right? Uh, those guys are generally walking it in, so to speak. So uh, they're working very closely with a spotter and they're calling corrections. And, uh, you know, I would be uh, astonished to learn that any of those um, uh, top five longest uh, snipes were uh, made with a Cold War first round hit. They almost certainly are not. And, and generally, those guys are sort of walking it in because of the distances they're working in. So uh, the fundamental difference between police and military snipers, as I say, is that they are working at a much, much higher standard of precision and uh, seeing this as a kid uh, was one of the things that got me into precision rifle shooting. So, you know, in 1993, I was um, 15 years old and I'd been shooting rifles for one year at that point. I got started when I was 14 in a place called uh, Vernon Army Cadet Camp here in British Columbia, Canada. And back in those days when I was an Army Cadet, I started out with uh, pre-war Lee Enfields that were actually converted to 22 LR. Uh, they weren't the original 303 Brits, they were uh, 22s. Uh, as well as the 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO uh, FN Fell, the right arm of the free world. It was called the uh, C1A1 here in Canada, the L1A1 in Britain, and uh, of course it's called the right hand of the free world everywhere else because there was a standard issue rifle among NATO countries, uh, all of them except for the United States, of course. That began my love affair with uh, the 308 as well, but that's a whole other story. So uh, in any case, um, I got started that year in, uh, in shooting, and uh, the following year in 1993, uh, a very, very famous incident happened that uh, got me uh, very interested in police uh, sniping. Uh, that was what is referred to as the shot seen around the world. That's an allusion to the shot heard around the world, which is a reference to the outbreak of the American uh, War of Independence in 1775. The shot seen around the world was the one that was televised. And that was a very famous incident in 1993 in Columbus, Ohio, where a police sniper named Mike Plum had shot a revolver, a 38 stub nose revolver, out of the hands of a suicidal man at 75 meters or 82 yards away. That made an impression that really lasted with me and I've always had immense respect for police snipers as a result of seeing that in my formative years as a rifleman. Uh, as a matter of fact, many, many years later when I got my first 308 precision rifle, which is this one here, uh, that did influence my purchasing decision because I ended up getting a police model. Uh, I was looking at this rifle and when I found out that it was uh, a part of Savage's law enforcement series that was like, Okay, that's I gotta have it, right? So it's uh, been very good to me and it uh, uh, lives up to the um, expectations that police snipers put upon their equipment. It is an excellent rifle and uh, that cartridge remains uh, the number one choice of police snipers, the 308 Winchester 762 by 51 NATO. Now our special guest is going to give us a little bit of insight into that famous Mike Plum incident. This guy has an incredible wealth of knowledge. I was immensely impressed by him. His name is Sam Garde and uh, he began his career as a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, his father was actually a Green Beret that served in uh, Vietnam. Here's a picture of him uh, with some Vietnamese Highlanders. And after Sam got out of the 82nd Airborne, he joined the uh, Chandler Police Department in Arizona and he served as a police officer for 20 years. Uh, half of it, the latter 10, was on the SWAT team. 
Uh, he was uh, initially an operator and he was a grenadier and he was a sniper and uh, when he finished his career in law enforcement after 20 years in the Chandler Police Department and 10 years on the SWAT team, he was a senior sniper and instructor for his team. Uh, after retiring, he started American Ronin, which is a firearms instruction and private investigation business. And uh, he's just an all-American patriot with an incredible career behind him, and he's doing amazing things, and I'd like to introduce you to him now. Hey, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm uh, honored to be here. I want to hear your uh, take on that, um, uh, the Mike Plum incident, which is so famous. I know as an insider, you know a lot of stuff about these uh, sort of engagements that a layperson like me would not know. That's that's right. Yeah. So uh, I've attended uh, many conferences and an organization that's uh, gathered a lot of information in that is the American Sniper Association. It is primarily geared towards uh, American law enforcement snipers. And as you know, I think your video kind of uh, talks about there's a difference between law enforcement snipers and military snipers. Um, and what their preferred skill sets are and what, and what uh, standard operating procedures are kind of different. And in uh, this case with the plum incident, the outcome was, is, was glorious. Uh, you know, it saved a life and uh, no one else was hurt. But uh, what it did was ruin the perception for the public is how they see uh, law enforcement snipers and what we're capable of and what, we, what we're able to do and what we what would be able to repeat on a routine basis. And what he did, well, it turned out great, is not something that we would advertise or want uh, to say that we could recreate on a uh, you know consistent basis. Uh, the shot, well, fabulous. And, and like I said, I can't, I, I have nothing wrong with the outcome. I love the outcome. Uh, but the odds of that ever happening again are slim to none. And it was a, it was a gamble of a shot to take it. And when I say gamble of a shot, I'm not referring to that sniper's accuracy. Mm -hmm. I know he's trained on the range. I know he's mm -hmm. sub-minute uh, sub uh, of angle um, capable. I'm talking about shooting a gun loaded with live ammunition mm -hmm. and counting on that that gun's not going to go off, counting on that fragments aren't going to hit him and injure him, counting on that when he's holding the gun, the, sh the, the shot doesn't move the gun and cause a round to go off somewhere else. There, there's a million different things that could have happened. Mm -hmm. And when I've attended uh, ASA's conferences, both on the West Coast and East Coast of the United States, uh, we've gone over that incident in detail and how it's kind of created a, uh, a CSI effect. For, mm -hmm. for those of you mm -hmm. watching, uh, cops, I'm a retired cop. I think he's done a, a kind of preview of my, my background, so you guys have some idea what I'm, I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you know, what I've done in the past. But the CSI effect is uh, basically from watching all these shows, the CSI Las Vegas, CSI Miami, CSI, and everyone thinks that um, things run like those TV shows and those technologies are immediately available to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So the expectation for what we can do and what we routinely do is unrealistic. Uh, in fact, just the way they sh those uh, the basis of the shows you created uh, there's generally two different lines of work in law enforcement. You have an identifications technician, and you have which goes out and aids in collecting the uh, the evidence. And you have a detective. Mm -hmm. That detective mm -hmm. is the one directing the the uh, technician what to collect and what to process. Sometimes you do have a new detective, and that technician can offer and, and a veteran technician can offer insight. But that technician is not a sworn employee. They do not carry a gun. They don't have arrest powers. They don't conduct the investigation. They merely collect the evidence and prepare it for evaluation by a scientist back at the police laboratory. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept mm -hmm. of the show is entirely unrealistic and not how a law enforcement agency is run. And I can't say 100% throughout the United States, but I would imagine that that system that they've portrayed is 90, at least 90% false. It is not run like that. So the CSI effect, um, when we say that, you, you know, that incident created a CSI effect for law enforcement snipers, what it is is create that expectation that mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. law enforcement sniper could do that and have the same outcome. Mm -hmm. Well, a majority of us are capable of the same accuracy. Uh, the outcome is, you know, a gamble. We, we don't know what would happen. We don't train that. Mm -hmm. We would mm -hmm. never train that. We train to stop the threat. In fact, reacting to suicides now has changed since that incident occurred. Um, in that incident, he was out in the public view. He was sitting in a chair. 
uh, we would still have to respond and deal with it because he's a threat to the public. He's waving around a gun in the middle of the public. However, a lot of law enforcement, you know, a lot, a lot of law enforcement agencies, not all of them, have changed the way they respond to suicides. So, if a person is inside of a house and he's threatening suicide with a firearm, if no one else is in the house, no one else is threatened, a lot of law enforcement agencies will, you know, refer them to a hotline, refer them to professional help. But we are not going to barricade outside the house and create a situation. We are going to go 10-8, which means we're going to go back into service. We're going to go back on patrol and suggest that whatever family may have called us to that incident, that they do not enter the house and that he take the advice that we gave him of calling the number. Uh, but because of past incidents where we have intervened, we have started a barricade around the house. Uh, it's elevated the situation. The person has come out. And uh, as you know, by seeing the news, a lot of people force us into – uh, shooting them because as soon as you bring bear a weapon or start to bear a weapon in our direction, we are trained to you know protect ourselves and protect others, and we cannot allow that weapon to be faced in our direction, and we'll take action. It's commonly referred to as suicide by cop, yeah. and then yeah. we're hated. We, you know we can't win. We're in a no-win situation, so we choose if we can not to be in that situation. I'm yeah, sorry, I've talked too long. You probably no, want to try no, to no, no, it's great. It's, it's brilliant. Thank you. No, I totally get that, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're, there, there's so many different outcomes that uh, can, can uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just amazed that his fingers weren't blown off. The shrapnel of the round hitting the frame of the revolver, it's amazing that he got out of it with all of his digits intact, you know, and, and it I It was could... a one in a million, uh, one in a million shot, and yeah. uh, I don't know if you've been able to get in contact with uh, Derek Bartlett, who's the president of uh, ASA, but... They have videoed, uh, my understanding, and attempted to recreate a similar shot like this um, because they've had chiefs of police and administrators say, wow, that's awesome. Could we have our guys do that? <laughs> and this is an organization that is in uh, supporting professional training mm -hmm. and uh, keeping snipers uh, a professional, making sure that we have standards that are kind of universal throughout the United States, accuracy standards, training standards, selection standards, equipment standards. Mm -hmm. A lot of agencies kind of go cheap on um, rifles. They will go to their evidence and they'll take out a piece of evidence, maybe an old hunting rifle that has been disposed of by the courts. And it's either up to the police department to get rid of or uh, or to destroy or something. Or repurpose and it. They'll, they'll convert it to mm -hmm. a sniper rifle. They don't know how many rounds has been fired through it. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they've They'll buy ammo. Uh, I think I talked to you briefly online about um, ammo selection. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what is it? Uh, federal gold medal match ammo is superbly accurate ammo. Great for matches. Excellent. But every year they hold a an ASA meeting in a conference, and there's usually about 100 snipers in there, some administrators, some sergeants of the unit and whatnot. And they'll ask, hey, who is still shooting uh, gold medal match ammo? And there's always snipers that will raise their hand and, it's something that Derek Bartlett rails on, and rightfully so, because that ammo will go right through one person yeah. into another person. And there is, you know, to me, it's mm -hmm. it's unprofessional. We're trying to, you know, keep our our profession um, smart and from being sued. And even though it's rare that snipers engage, we want to have the right ammo. And when if we have someone behind, uh, you know, we want to know that if we can shoot the bad guy, and we're not going to have over penetration issues, or who knows. You know, those, that ammo will go through multiple walls, multiple persons, and we have to have faith in our ammo that if there's an innocent behind our, our target that we can shoot and our ammo will, will be terminally ballistic inside that person and, and be able to do that. But otherwise, it's it's already a high liability job. You can have even more liability if you're using the wrong ammo. So he tries to get out information like that. He tries to – and he won't say – go out and buy Hornady yeah, AMAC yeah. tap ammo. Right. <laughs> that is the most popular one used right now by American snipers. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I see. We'll put up a little screenshot here. Hornady yeah. tap 168, yeah. I guess. Hornady, right? I, I want my check. Yeah. <laughs> In my experience, I, 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 I'm not speaking scientifically, yeah. but I've gone to a few conferences and it, it seems to me to be the most popular. Uh, by no way scientific, so please and don't. We're talking the 168, same as the SMKs, right? Yes, 168 yeah. uh, AMAX tap ammo. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people I've heard, you know, uh, what is it, 175 or something, some different grains, mm -hmm. but AMAX tap ammo being yeah. the most popular. Are there others that work and just as well as Hornady? Of course there is. Uh, there, there are other brands, but 
in my experience, uh, my team used it. Other teams around the Valley used it. Uh, the only change we were making is we were switching from that to their new ELR ammo, mm -hmm. which had the same ballistic uh, profile that from my understanding, and there's people a lot smarter than this with ballistics than me, I'm still kind of getting into the long game and starting to understand stuff. But that wasn't our uh, area of concentration as an LE sniper, but um, they changed the tip uh, basically yeah. not to melt under long distances, which really didn't affect us. We, we're of shooting course, most yeah. close distances, but that they were going to stop making it allegedly. And, and so they're like, you might as well get on board because we stockpiled the ammo. So we had enough to train for. So that's another thing is uh, law enforcement snipers. If you're smart, you do not train with a different ammo than what right. you shoot. Of course. Uh, yeah. You know, you can get away with a pistol. You can get away with a carbine, imprecise topics, imprecise mm -hmm. training. You want to know and depend on your ammo that it's going to, it's going to be as accurate when you need it all the time. So we always trained with our, the same uh, duty ammo we did now. Mm -hmm. The only difference being we were issued different types of ammo. We were issued uh, mostly our, our Amex tap ammo was our, we called open air ammo. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, an ammo that we trained with 99% uh, of the time. We had uh, armor piercing rounds, which we fired to make sure they functioned right. Mm -hmm. We fired to test the accuracy and see their, uh, how, how they deviated from our current zero. Mm -hmm. And then we also had barrier rounds, uh, federal barrier rounds, which were used for heavy glass or he heavy uh, barricaded items that we wanted to get through. But we found out after uh, testing some of those that our Hornady ammo actually was more accurate than our uh, bonded ammo. And mm -hmm. it actually performed just as well going through uh, light grade uh, automobile glass. So, and that was uh, the that was the Amax back then because now I think they've replaced the Amax with the ELD bullets, which have that ELD. Yeah. yeah, and that's that heat shield tip you alluded to that doesn't melt uh, at uh, long range, right? So it doesn't deform right. and affect the BC of the bullet. But um, yeah, I think uh, when I looked up that Hornady tap, because I am aware of some uh, law enforcement agencies here in Canada that are using Hornady tap as their uh, sniper load, right? So. Uh, it's not, an old yeah. It still works just great. And if you're yeah. a law enforcement, you're not worried about, uh, you know, the tip deforming at 700 yards because yeah. that's not a typical shot you're going to make. <laughs> you I wouldn't say never. You never say never because yeah. life is weird. But, yeah, uh, yeah that, that is not, not typical. Yeah, Maybe if you're a, uh, I don't know, a forest ranger or something and you yeah. got into a really weird scenario. <laughs> few city yeah. blocks, right? A police engagement a few city blocks away. <laughs> yeah, that that would still be, you know, we uh pretty pretty strange. And I think you, you alluded to some in your uh some of your online postings, but and I think the previous part of this video, but uh mm -hmm. yeah, law, uh, law enforcement has to be accountable for every round. We always yeah. Uh, taught mm -hmm. our guys, hey, there is a blank check attached to every bullet you send that goes out of that barrel. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the bare minimum of it. Mm -hmm. You could be put in prison if you, yeah. you know, shoot the wrong thing. And it, and it doesn't matter if like, okay, I hit the bad guy, but my bullet went through and then hit a good guy. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. still going to pay for it. And we had those extreme consequences for our accuracy. Uh, our, our worst case scenario that we teach is a hostage uh, situation where we have a partially obscured target uh, that's moving. Oh. And so it's one thing to, you know, to be able to hit a a uh, target where you're laying flat at the range and your target's not moving. Mm -hmm. and it's another thing in real life to be able to do it. So we try and uh, prepare as best we can by uh, using stress inoculation. So physical exertion, push-ups, sit-ups, running, burpees. Uh, even our our actual firearms test involves uh, stress, uh, stress inoculation by means of physical exertion and working under time. Mm -hmm. So uh, example, we tell, hey, go run down the the road uh, 200 yards and run back and by the way you have a total of whatever two and a half three minutes i'm just kind of spitballing here because without the uh the qual sheet i don't know exactly what it was but come back here and then make four headshots at 200 yards so all of our strings kind of involved uh, some of that uh, mm -hmm. stress inoculation so is it the yeah. most stressful ever no but it's it's different than our pistol quals because our pistol quals had no stress inoculation we stood, we drew from our holster. Now we had a time, mm. but there was no physical exertion. And we had a big giant target and the furthest that got away was 25 yards. Yeah, it's interesting. Pistol. They have to do something, I guess, but it, it must be hard to duplicate the, the real stress that you referred to of, you know, uh, shooting in built up areas and urban areas where you have innocent people all around you. It's not like an open plain in Afghanistan where a guy is taking shots on a, 
on a on a Taliban guy, uh, you know, in a in a in a in an open plane where there's no risk of hitting an innocent person. You know, it's it's a very very different type of engagement where you have uh, you're in a city typically, I guess, and it's you know you're surrounded by innocent people. And uh, you know, in in the case even going back to 1993, there were television cameras everywhere. So you know, there are multiple stressors uh, that uh, would um, you know impart a a mental force on someone in your position and that must be very difficult. It's very different from uh, shooting, like I said, in an open plane in a war zone somewhere, you know, shooting in uh, in downtown Phoenix or something like that, right? It must be very stressful. Yeah, there is, uh, you know, it's probably not as clean and exactly as fun people might have seen, as fun as people think it might be seeing it on the movies and seeing it in t television shows. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say there's any, there's not any typical deployment, but, uh, you know, when a, uh, a barricaded subject that's shooting starts kicking off, um, and depends on what city you are, Phoenix has a full-time team. They're blessed with a, a full-time team mm -hmm. and their city supports it. And they have multiple teams actually, mm -hmm. and their, their work justifies it. They have so many incidents going on that it's, mm -hmm. it's their team is justified. I would argue that my team was just fine having a full-time team. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I love my team. I love my brothers and, uh, and we had work at one uh, one time when we were uh, working for our narcotics unit. They kept us busy nonstop, uh, pretty much. When their work went down, that was the bulk of our work, and we we didn't do a uh, ton of other stuff. But we we had barricades, barricaded shooters, and that involved uh, since we're, we were a part time or a call a collateral duty. We're all out doing our duties. We're on patrol. We're detectives. Uh, we're SROs, wherever. And then pretty much when we get that call, we drop whatever we're doing and we go to a central meeting spot. Some of us are fortunate enough to be on a detail or position where we carry some of our gear with us. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my final assignment was in a, a fugitive squad where we were able to carry much of the of our equipment with us. And uh, not all of it, but we carried some of it. And we could respond at a higher level than patrol could and, mm -hmm. and some other detectives could. But uh, yeah, as a sniper, uh, we want to get eyes on it. People think of like, shooting, but a lot of our job is reporting back intelligence to our command staff to allow them to make a good decision. Just like uh, military guys, they're observers, right? You're, you're trained exactly. in observation, you're trained in, uh, you know, in observation and intelligence gathering. That's a fundamental part of your job, same as the mill side. And it, and it ends up being most of it. Um, yeah. Now, when we deploy, we deploy on, unless anyone says anything, we deploy on a standard use of force uh, policy, which means if I would shoot them while I'm patrolling or I'd shoot them when I'm doing my other detective job that I would, I would still act that way. The only difference is, is now I'm specially equipped and it's a different scenario and we're going to that scenario. So um, there are different uh, command directives that they can issue that some departments have. One, uh, and I don't, I don't like these command directives because it's basically shutting down uh, the discretion of the operator or the sniper that's going in and deploying and the command not seeing what they're seeing, but yet telling them, hey, no matter what, don't shoot. Mm -hmm. Well, they should have a good reason for doing that, maybe because there's multiple suspects or something else, but it's pretty frustrating from the sniper level or the operator level when you see that guy actively shooting and you're told do not engage. I haven't experienced that, but that is a command they can give. Mm -hmm. The other command they can give is, um, and it goes by different names, uh, I think the slang term might be uh, that person's been green-lighted. Uh, I think that's more gang terminology, but... Uh, there are, are codes, uh, Directive 2 or Directive 3 or whatever. You know, different departments have different codes, but they they put that over the radio, and, and most of our tactical channels are encrypted now so the media can't listen in because mm -hmm. uh, the media loves to listen in, and then later they'll find out, oh, Directive 3 means shoot at first opportunity. The reason that you would have such a directive is there's people already at the scene, and people at the scene have already justified, hey, this person has already used deadly force. He's already killed someone. He's still actively shooting at the first opportunity. I can't take him out because all I have is a pistol and I'm pinned down by fire. Mm -hmm. But at the first opportunity, when one of you snipers get in position, take him out as quick as you can because he's such a threat and immediate danger to the public mm -hmm. that he needs to be taken out. Mm -hmm. So I haven't worked under one of those directives either. Mm -hmm. um, but that it was a possible directive they could have issued us is basically, you don't need to see it firsthand. We've already seen it. Trust us, just go and shoot them. And, and we, because of the trust we have uh, in law enforcement on ourselves, um, we don't have time to question what they've seen and interview them. In a, in a normal comm setting, we might do that. Uh, but when action needs to be taken, you have to trust your brother and you have to go out and he says, 
take that person out because he's been, you know, you just have to imagine he's seen something that's justified it. Mm -hmm. But every most every time we go there, it's the normal use of force. So if you see something that that uh, justifies that person being taken out and it's the same uh, pretty much all over the place. Is the person a deadly threat to yourself or is it a deadly threat to someone else? Mm -hmm. Is he firing a gun off out the window randomly, mm -hmm. you know, where he could hit a, a citizen or a resident? So mm -hmm. one of those deployments, if he's doing it from his house, might look like one of us going about eight houses down in, in a traditional neighborhood mm -hmm. and start hopping the back walls of the street across. We'd like to get at least two corners uh, on that house so that way we can see the full house. Ideally, we have some more positions and ideally we want uh, two snipers paired together. Mm -hmm because of staffing because of where everyone's at when these things kick out it's um it's kind of like duck duck goose you never know where your people are going to be you just as soon as you like hear that it's uh, where the incident is you go there as fast as you can and, and you do as, as much as you can until everyone gets there so, so me, i if you have if you have two snipers are they typically situated together or are they separated on 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 uh you know separate arcs of fire within radio contact or how does that work it depends uh how many how many you have uh -huh. and and what's going on with the house if there's an exit in the rear house or the person that's been active in the rear house but yeah if you have you like to put the two snipers together we train together we talk together we speak the same language mm -hmm. uh, but if all you had was two snipers then you probably want them on opposite sides of the house mm -hmm. and obviously we want elevation because we're worried yeah. about crossfire we don't want to be shooting at each other uh so that that is definitely a concern mm -hmm. but uh so like I went on a deployment and we were hopping a bunch of backyards. That's also not a uh, not a fun thing to do in a country where we know everyone's armed to the teeth. Yeah. And uh, my assignment at that time was as a, a fugitive detective, so I'm wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt. Oh, now geez. I put on right. my vest, uh, but otherwise, uh, aside from my vest and my sniper rifle and my pack, I've got nothing that you know identifies me as a cop. Luckily, right. the, the vest is free. And I had another guy with me. He wasn't a uh, he wasn't a sniper. But uh, he was the one of the first guys on scene, and he's in good. All of us. That's why another reason. All of the during the selection, you're going to be in SWAT. You have to be in good shape. You're going to be mm -hmm. had to. We had to hop a series of walls, six houses down. Sometimes walking on the wall like a cat because the, there's a dog that wants to eat you, you know. And then expect citizens to come out and be like, "Hey, I'm a cop. I'm going through because there's a guy, as you know, shooting out his window down there. We're going to try and keep you safe." And so most citizens that we run into. In, in my city, we're understanding of that. Uh, there are other cities in which citizens don't care what you're doing. They hate you, and they might just take a shot at you, which makes your job even harder. And the reason why we'd be cutting through the backyards is uh, we, we're looking for the most covered and concealed route to set up a hide uh, where this person's at. So would we normally trespass in someone's yard? or the, No, and we don't want to do that. But we can't walk up in front of a house where some guy's randomly shooting at. That's just mm -hmm. bad tactics. Mm -hmm. So I know you might have some viewers who be like, oh, you can't trespass my property. We don't want you in your... Brother, I don't want to be in your property either, but I don't want to get shot at. And unless you... we got to solve that situation down the street. So, I mean, either you allow me to get through your backyard so I don't get shot, or you're going to have to tolerate the guy randomly shooting down the street. And I think I'm the worst of two evils. So, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think most people would be reasonable, but um, yeah, I, I guess going back to that Mike Plum thing, uh, you mentioned the Hollywood effect, and they, I guess they just expect every potentially dead, deadly threat now to be dealt with non-destructively, so nobody's harmed, including the uh, the deadly threat. They expect you to shoot every uh, uh, firearm out of uh, out of a perp's hand because uh, the, of that famous incident. That's the fundamental problem that you know the expectations are unreasonable because of it. It did, and it. Uh... It not only affected police snipers, but it uh, it translated into all cops. We already had the, uh, you know, people asking regular patrol officers, why didn't you just shoot him in the leg? Yeah. Why didn't you? If we have to pull out our firearm and, and use it, it's because there is a deadly threat on the other end, and we need to stop the deadly threat. Mm -hmm. It is hard enough to shoot a person center mass, which is what we're trained, because this is the biggest portion of the body mm -hmm. uh, that's moving around. It's hard enough to do that without trying to shoot someone in the leg. Plus, shooting someone in the leg will not necessarily stop them. I don't know if you're familiar with the incident that happened with the FBI in, in uh, Miami. It caused them to reevaluate their selection of firearms, their caliber, their Smith bullets, and, and to, uh, yeah. And they changed a bunch after that. They did a study, and they're like, hey. And they had very determined suspects, one of them uh, Army veteran. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that incident, they, they decided, hey, 
our guys had good hits, but these guys were extremely motivated. Mm -hmm. So and another thing in Hollywood, just because you shoot someone in the chest does not mean that they're going to go down and just give up. Now, some people will because they're mentally destroyed when you do that. There are other people that until their body shuts down, mm -hmm. they are not going to quit. And uh, so that's, you know, you got those varying uh, different points of view or different experience, different suspects that you might um, encounter. Mm -hmm. Now, snipers were taught uh, to aim for parts in the human anatomy of the head that will turn off a human like a light switch. Mm -hmm. It's not nice. It's not kind. Uh, but the only reason we would do that is to save a life. Yeah. If uh, someone's being held hostage, there's a gun to someone else's head. We can't allow the, their muscles to contract and pull that trigger because we are doing it to save a person's life. So if we turn them off like a light switch and shoot them in the right portion in the head, their hands will relax and they'll crumple to the ground just as if someone has cut the power to a robot or something else. And that's the effect we're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult shot. Uh, that's why we don't tell our patrol officers normally to shoot in the head. Uh, we do teach them that if they have no effect shooting in the chest, to start suspect or start thinking that your suspect may have body armor yeah. and then to move upstairs if you can to the head mm -hmm. or if not the head then the pelvic girl because the mm -hmm. pelvic girl can immobilize your suspect and that way the suspect slowed down now you can either make a headshot or go back to the chest if you didn't have armor but uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of good training going on these days and it's more than the public hears about two to the chest one to the head well that's great, and we do think about people wearing armor and, and going upstairs if we need to, but the pelvic girl is also a very viable point to slow a person down and uh, for us to be able to make a shot. You know, it's a lot easier when people are slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so that's, that's a tactic, something we, we train. It's not top secret or new. <laughs> so, so any bad guys listening ahead, to this, if you don't want to get shot in the sack, then, you know, try to behave yourself. <laughs> Yeah, so that's another thing. The media would be like, why would he shoot him down there? Uh, the technical answer is that's the pelvic girdle. Your mm -hmm. ball joint and your hip move mm -hmm. like this. If we fracture that, you're no longer going to walk and move around. Mm -hmm. Does it happen to be the same place your junk is? Yes. Uh, another thing that uh, misconception is that people have is, well, cops shoot to kill. No, we shoot to stop. If you stop attacking us, you stop presenting a deadly threat, mm -hmm. we will stop shooting and assess the situation. Mm -hmm. And if the threat is gone, you throw your gun away and you give up, we will go over there and we will render aid to you. Mm -hmm. We will throw a tourniquet on. We will plug the holes we just made in you. We don't want to kill you. We want to stop the threat. Now, coincidentally, the best way to stop a threat is to put some holes in your plumbing. Mm -hmm. That has deadly effects. It has a side effect of causing to kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is to make you stop attacking us or make you stop attacking someone else with a deadly threat. Yeah. That, that, that's a side effect. So mm. um, it's a little bit PC to say that. We don't shoot to kill. We shoot, shoot to stop the threat. But it is more accurate. And it, it is um, shown true by you've seen cops on videos after shootings. They have went over and plugged the holes of their suspects. Oh, they yeah. did not want to kill them. They were yeah. forced into that situation. Uh, do we oh, have cops sure. that are bad actors? Yes. Yeah. We have cops that are bad actors. I can't sit here and say we're perfect. But every group, bar none, I I challenge anyone to tell me a group where they had no no bad actors, no bad apples. Yeah. Uh, so most all the guys that I worked with, I had a I had a great department, a great department, and great uh, people that I worked with. I don't have anything bad to say about them. I mean, uh, any of my complaints would be you know superficial and just. They're not even worth mentioning. I, I work with some really great guys. So tell me, now that you're running American Ronin and you're, uh, you're a firearms instructor uh, full-time, you're no longer in the force, uh, is first aid something that's fundamental to what you teach, for example, in your CCW courses? Is a, you know, Do you encourage your students to carry a tourniquet? Uh, I do. I don't teach uh, first aid uh, right now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the credentials. I've had oh, a lot I of cross-training for tactical yeah. medics doing it. I don't hold any medical instruction. Oh. I mostly concentrate on uh, firearm stuff, yep. but it is something that I bring up. It's not like it's absent from the class whatsoever. So I'll talk about, hey, and it, and then it's kind of up to them. So as law enforcement and first responders, we're kind of obligated once the scene is safe and it makes sense. Now, we're, you know, obviously we wouldn't put ourselves in danger to go render aid yeah. uh, to a suspect, mm. uh, to an, an innocent or a hostage. Yeah, we will, you know, we'll go in harm's way to, to help them. But a suspect we're not going to so we we talk about that and you know with my concealed carry classes and you know 
having a tourniquet, having being able to prepare to give aid. And that also goes to show, just like it shows for cops, that, hey, I didn't want to kill this person. He presented a deadly threat to me, and I was doing this, you know, because I wanted to save my life or I wanted to save my wife's life or save my kid's life or save my neighbor, whoever, whatever person they were presenting a deadly threat to, that you only did it as a last resort and is, you know, to save a life. And then if you feel comfortable, the problem is, is that cops uh, often work in pair. Well, we if we don't work in pairs, then we have someone that's coming on because they know what you're doing from being on the radio. Yeah. And it's not really true of civilians. So you may not have someone you can say, uh, hey, Lucas, could you provide cover, lethal cover? Will I go over here, sweep the gun away, and then provide aid to them? So that's a little bit harder for a civilian to do, but it is an option. Uh, maybe the person throw the gun. Maybe they do feel safe enough going up there. Um, it, it just depends on the scenario. There's a million different scenarios because life is crazy and yeah. throws crazy things at us. So, but yeah, I definitely present it as an option and how good it looks for them like to show that, hey, this was my last resort and I didn't have ill will towards these people. I, right. I just thought my life was threatened. Yeah, it, it just occurs to me now that it might be um, a sound uh, legal precaution as well. I mean, uh, you know, there's uh, there are vexatious lawsuits all the time. Uh, uh, someone, uh, you know, you hear about that all the time where, where someone is sued for, for trying to do the right thing and, and maybe having a tourniquet on you is, uh, is a good insurance policy to, you know, show, to the, show the judge down the road where, you know, um, I didn't have malicious intent. In fact, I, I, you know, I carry this pistol. Of course, we're talking about Americans here because uh, we lost that right a long time ago here in Canada. Maybe one day we'll get it back. But, um, you know, um, yeah, maybe carrying a tourniquet besides being um, a compassionate uh, precaution is also a sound legal one, too. Yeah, I have an aid. I, I carry firearms mm -hmm. most everywhere I go, but I also have an aid bag. Uh, in my truck as well, and that's full of uh, tourniquets, bandages, uh, tweezers for people to get. We live in Arizona, so there's cactus. Mm -hmm. yeah. But people are making cactus <laughs> up in all the time. You go with kids out in the desert hiking or whatnot, so you learn to carry the little things, little tiny band aids. It's always the little things. They, like, I'm prepared for World War Three, but all I need is a band aid. <laughs> oh crap, I didn't bring that. So it, I've, I've picked up little things and thrown more things in my aid bag over time. But yes, right. definitely a thing. But I wouldn't want someone to have it so set in their mind. And we were always worried about law enforcement getting this too, getting this stuck in their head of like, what are the cameras going to think? Right. What is the news going to think? And if that's so forward in your brain that you forget good tactics and good sense and you sacrifice good tactics and good sense because of what you think it might look like, mm -hmm. uh, that's gone too far. Uh, now, we do want you to be prepared to render aid, but mm -hmm. only if it's safe to render aid, you know? Uh, it may be the safest thing for a civilian to do after, you know, maybe it's a small framed female mm -hmm. and she was in a dark parking lot and faced an attacker. She had to shoot him and now she ran away because that was the safest thing for her to do. She didn't know if he was mortally wounded. She didn't know if she grazed him and, you know, maybe sticking around to find out is not the best idea, you know, when you're all alone. Oh, yeah. You know, so it, it just depends what situation you're in. Mm -hmm. As long as you can articulate and justify why you did what you did. You know, I think you'll you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But training and education are the best uh, fix for that. If you you don't go out and find people that are you know experts in their fields and learn from them, then it's, it's just kind of uh, you're going to be stuck in your own logic. Or may, a lot of people don't even think about it. You know, uh, situational training and and, uh, and envisioning scenarios and how you would react to them, and then better yet, having a buddy you can vent them to. Hey, I mentioned I was in a restaurant and if something happened. I would do this and this and, you know, bouncing it off of someone, someone else that's knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's good. But you might want to think about this too. Send your family out the back door before you go to work because uh, you don't want your family as uh, you know, in the background while you're engaging in a firefight with someone. So something uh, cops, cops always want to, not all cops, some cops want to intervene and feel they can't not intervene in a bad situation that goes out in public, even if they're off duty. And I'm not talking about a shop left. I'm talking about an active shooter or something like that. And I feel that way the same same way myself. But you have to make sure your family's safe. And you can't start a firefight with them in the background. Yeah. So these are things you have to think about and talk to your family about before you, you know, find yourself in the middle of the situation. Telling them on the spot. <laughs> I guess it's better than nothing. But that's not what you want to talk about. It. You want to, hey, remember what we talked? Yeah, get out of here. Go to the car. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I encourage uh, wives. Of, in fact, how I started my teaching uh, was while well, I was still an active cop, and I started teaching girlfriends and wives of cops. 
Oh. We're gone 10, 12, 16, sometimes a whole day, you know, before we come back. Uh, we're great protectors, but we can't be there yeah. all the time. And as cops, we know we're not going to have an instantaneous response. Uh, we realize that as a citizen, when seconds count, we are minutes away. Yeah. And it's not for us not wanting to be there. Yeah. Well, we joined this. We signed up to be there. We want nothing more than to be there for the fight. If I could push away all the, the civilians and go in and fight, well, mm-hmm. by golly, that's what I signed up for. Mm-hmm. It's just not physically possible. Yeah. And the only way to allow them uh, to have a chance, a fighting chance, is to teach and to arm them. Because yeah. uh, there's, And if we had enough cops to be everywhere at once, would that be a country we want to live in? Yeah, exactly. I don't think we'd want to live in a place like that. Mm-hmm. So there's a balance, how many cops versus how fast of a response time. But uh, to me, as a father, you are responsible for the safety of your family. Mm-hmm. You know you can't be with your family 24-7 because we had to go out and earn a living. Yeah. So we had to teach our wives and we had to teach our girlfriends how to protect themselves. The mm-hmm. ultimate equalizer in the world these days is a handgun. It's a defensive weapon for our personal safety. And I believe you know if you're truly a feminist or you, yeah. you want to be independent, yeah. then you should be very pro-gun because yeah. guns help us protect you know, you could be a 5'2 female mm-hmm. going against a 6'4", 300-pound male. Physically, not a chance. You put a gun in their hands, and some people will say, well, they'll just get the gun taken away from them and then uh, used against them. They at least have a chance. And if you mm-hmm. seek out training and figure out how to use it and be responsible with it, mm-hmm. then there's not a good a chance, not, not as uh, big a chance of, of that to happening. Now, right. sure, if you yeah. buy a gun, you don't get any training. Yeah. You throw it in your purse and you walk around and you've got no clue, then yeah, you have good chances of that happening to you because you were irresponsible. You didn't learn how to use it. You didn't learn how to shoot it. You didn't learn how to deploy it. You didn't learn about the consequences if you miss. You don't know what your capabilities are because you've never gone to the range and pushed it. So yeah, there's there's some truth for that. To, but the big thing is if you're responsible mm-hmm. and you're a responsible gun owner, you train, educate yourself, now you have a fighting chance. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you rather have a fighting chance of not being murdered not being victimized, not being raped, as opposed to... Sorry, I've got way off the topic No, no, it's, it's all good. It, it's important there. stuff. I mean, I wish people talked about the stuff more. I mean, uh, you know, here in Canada, we have a, a, a really sort of unfortunate group which has hijacked a tragedy that happened in Canada, mass shooting, a, 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 a terrible tragedy, uh, an incident of femicide where this psychopath went into a, a college and unfortunately murdered... Uh, scores of women and it was a uh, one of the you know one of the low points in this country's history is a appalling thing and um, Unfortunately that tragedy has been hijacked. It just passed actually just a couple days ago So it's kind of apropos that we're talking about it, but um, you know that tragedy has been hijacked by a really radical anti-gun group that Exploits that tragedy for political gain, you know, they're, they they constantly use it to uh, to advance the agenda of disarmament in Canada and uh, it's it's it breaks my heart because you know I have a wife, I have a, a daughter, a seven-month-old daughter, and one day she'll be um, out there in the world. And I wish she had the um, uh, I wish she lived in a place. I hope that she'll live in a place then when, where you know she her government protects her right to um, to self-defense and to have effective tools for self-defense. Because you know to me a, a feminist in the uh, in the contemporary sense, not in the true sense, but a in the contemporary sense, a feminist is someone who would rather have uh, a woman raped than a rapist shot. Correct. Yeah, that you is know. the set. And it makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely no sense. But, uh, yeah, we call those uh, places where they prohibit guns still in America defenseless victim zones. Yeah, or and, free fire uh, zones, you know. And, and if, you, if you look yeah. at the studies, the vast majority of, of uh, mass shootings in the United States happen in these gun-free zones like this... Uh, now you mentioned uh, you know Miami with regards to that famous police incident, but there was also that shooting at the uh, the gay bar some time ago, and that was a gun free zone. They don't talk about that. That you know these are free fire zones where people you know their natural right to uh, prepare for the worst day of their lives is is uh, taken away from them under threat of uh, 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 legal action of one kind or another, and uh, that doesn't make people safer. Making uh, good people defenseless doesn't make bad people harmless. I I don't know how many how we can get through to some of these people who think that uh, taking guns away from people like you and me uh, is going to make uh, my my kids or my family or my neighbors any safer. It makes us less safe. And, and that's obviously, look at the United States, which is always used by these anti-gun people 
uh, as uh, proof of, of their, um, you know, of the wisdom of their philosophy. But that's only if you don't actually look because, uh, you know, the places in the United States where you have uh, the most sort of uh, um, liberalized gun laws in the sense that people have their liberties, those are the places you have the least gun violence. And every time they restrict gun ownership, places like California, it goes up. So, um, you know, the, there is no uh, fact or statistically based uh, argument for uh, gun control in the sense of civil disarmament because it only uh, worsens, it only emboldens and empowers criminals. But, uh, you know, um, it's, it's hard getting through to people in this country because we've become so um, uh, normalized to civil disarmament that, you know, uh, now they're talking about banning our handguns. My wife has a pistol, I have a pistol, and we may be forced to hand them over because um, the, the federal government in Ottawa is um, empowering the provinces to uh, implement province-wide gun bans. So our choices are living in BC, we can move to Alberta where I'm from, it's a beautiful place, it's uh, much more conservative, but we like living on the ocean, we love the climate here, there's no winter to speak of really. Uh, but we may be, you know, forced to give up our handguns and uh, that's not going to make us any safer. You know, our safety record with our handguns is perfect. It's uh, better than many of the uh, 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 people, you know, here in, uh, here in Vancouver, we had an RCMP officer lose a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. You know, so, so, you know, this idea that only police can be trusted with firearms, there's, you know, it's ridiculous. We're either citizens or subjects. The, the nice thing about the United States is that um, you know, your, uh, your citizenship is enshrined in, in law. Uh, we're still uh, de facto British subjects, and, uh, and that's a problem. Yeah, the, uh, there's, there's no way to ban evil, uh, but somehow uh, opponents on the other side have found the object of a firearm and assigned it a characteristic of evilness. Mm -hmm. But both the good and the bad use it. Yeah. And if you ban guns, as we've seen on TV and in the news, yeah. they'll use knives, they'll use vehicles, yeah. they'll use bombs. There is no banning evil. Mm -hmm. All you can do is allow your citizens the capability to defend themselves. Yeah. If you yeah. deny them that, you have now subjected them to the evil in society without a defense, knowing that the police and the military forces you have are insufficient mm -hmm. to defend mm -hmm. everyone. Now, the military is great for defending our borders and our country, mm -hmm. keeping us free from invasions. The police department goes out and detects crime, but they can't possibly protect every individual at every moment. And as we discussed, I'm not sure you'd want a country or world yeah. that you had an officer living in your backyard or, you know, in your own house. <laughs> we don't want that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be micromanaged. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a gun is just a means to defense. So, yeah, it's uh, to me, they're, they, they skew the statistics, too. You talked about Chicago and other what, what they don't tell a lot of people, what these anti-gun organizations don't tell a lot of people is when they stat gun violence, most of them are suicides. Yeah. You take up the suicides and now you have a small element of violent crime. Of that violent crime, mm -hmm. how many of those firearms were lawfully purchased mm -hmm. or acquired? Mm -hmm. A very small percentage. Mm -hmm. Most of them are stolen firearms by gang members, yeah. stolen in burglaries. None of them were legally acquired. Why you would expect a criminal to obey the law in the first place is beyond me. But that is the liberal logic. Yeah. Now, you, we do have individuals, and, and some of them make poor choices with their guns. But guess what? We have laws for those. Mm -hmm. We have uh, In Arizona, we have endangerment. You go leave your, your firearm on the bathroom, a public bathroom, and you walk out and you leave it there. And for a kid to find it hurt himself, there's a law for that. Yeah. We don't need to ban guns. There's a law. You hold that individual accountable, yeah. not everyone else. Just the same as we wouldn't ban cars because one person gets in there, drinks and drives and kills somebody. It's a horrible incident. Yeah. That person needs to be individually held accountable, but you wouldn't ban everyone from driving a car because of what one person did. The same as you wouldn't do for a right. And you, you, you phrased it exactly. It's a God-given right of self-defense that the governments should enshrine in documentation saying we acknowledge and support your God-given right to self-defense which I equate directly in this modern age is, is, uh, is owning a pistol. We've gotten way off topic. Uh, we're no, so no, there is no topic. The topic is talking about whatever our, uh, the yeah. guest that I'm, I'm lucky enough to have on the show wants to talk about. And I'm thrilled that uh, you're willing to take time out of your day and chat with us. And this is all important stuff because uh, especially with the, the civil disarmament issue uh, in your country as well. I mean, you have a, a horrendous uh, a head of state, unfortunately, right now. I just about operate from the, you know, the idea that you're evil 
until you've proven otherwise if you uh, you're a democrat voter how could you yeah. not know i mean even if you watch cnn you've got to see all yeah. the retractions you've got to see the people being fired from cnn yeah. um you know that we call it the communist news network <laughs> that's that's cnn how many times have they retracted and how many times have they been sued and now where's that poor kid that was in uh, washington dc that they just demonized they just got done demonizing Rittenhouse. He's oh, the next Kyle one. Rittenhouse. Yeah, that was, was that? Uh, that was. Uh, um, He's the next one to get paid Wisconsin, out by. Wisconsin, wasn't it? It was yeah. Wisconsin, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but there was a. There's another fellow that was uh, standing in front of a uh, Indian American guy. Oh was, yeah, and he got like two hundred. He was wearing a mega hat. That's right, because they yeah. completely slandered him. They completely yes. vilified him, and he and all ended he up. Was standing there. He didn't do anything. He just no, stood he there with he just stood there with his with his uh, "Make America Great Again" hat. That's it. And uh, you know? the other guy approached him. He didn't march up and get in his face. The yeah. other guy approached him, expecting to intimidate him, and he didn't back down. And the media didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the media lied uh, a ton about the Kyle Rittenhouse scenario. Those yeah. lies came out if you watched the trial. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't see the trial if you watched CNN. Right. Because guess what? When the truth comes out and the facts are known. That means all the reporting is revealed as false, yeah. and they don't want to show that. So you didn't see it. But if you watch Fox or other channels, you would see the actual trial, and you can see, hey, oh, lo and behold, mm -hmm. all their things that they had uh, said on the news are false. That's crazy. Just mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, I'm waiting for that uh, prosecutor to be brought up on uh, judicial or um, prosecut prosecutorial misconduct. It was, and, it was like a black comedy. It was like a, a dark comedy where, you know, it just got crazier and crazier that that prosecutor at one point he, he had the AR-15 bolt closed his finger on the trigger and he's pointing it at the jury like you're going what the hell is wrong with this guy I mean this guy was nuts you know and and uh, you know it's 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 one of those rabbit holes we could go down like you have these BLM protesters saying defund the police we can police our own community well isn't that what Rittenhouse did yeah, you know? yeah. There's uh, memes with uh, Alec Baldwin next to the prosecutor saying, "Yes, just like that. Make sure you have your finger on the trigger." Unreal. Uh, Sam, we're uh -huh. going to run out of time because Zoom, uh, I think, caps us at 40 minutes. Is what I what Google told me before I started it, and uh, I'm not sure how far along we are, but I think we're pretty close to that. So uh, I'm going to thank you for your time. You know, it's amazing that you've uh, you've joined us. It's it's an honor. It's a pleasure. I, I was looking forward to it all week and. And how was your trip to Hawaii, by the by the way? You just got back, and you were training. Oh, that's uh, great. That's great. Teaching out I'm, there? Uh, I do a bunch of things. So I, I uh, do firearms. I yeah. I work security. I even do real estate. Yeah. And and private investigations. So th this was a uh, security gig that took took me over there and back. And it, uh, I I'm blessed to have such a job and to work with some uh, some great guys. All the guys on this uh, particular security detail that I work are all retired PD from uh, all over the country. So. It is great to talk to them and see how other PDs ran things and mm -hmm. kind of tell war stories and oh we get paid to have these meetings and uh, guard stuff while we're doing it so it's 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 a good time. That's awesome, time. Sam. Yeah, yeah. But I'm back, glad to be back in Arizona. Arizona's got I think the best gun laws in the entire country, and uh, Hawaii's laws are not so uh, yeah. not so good gun gun wise. But uh, yeah, but they paid me well, so that's good. Yeah, I think you know, a fun trip. Hawaii is kind of like the British Columbia of, of America. It's like the well, Florida I think is is a better analog, and and Florida is nothing like BC because uh, Florida has one of the best governors of any political jurisdiction anywhere in the world. So, you know, in my uh, fantasy world, I'm my family's living in Key West, but uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the United States makes the State Department makes it very very difficult for sort of ordinary people like me, Canadians, to uh, to uh, immigrate to the U.S. I mean, if you're a if you're a physician or if you're an engineer, then they have fast tracks. If you're very wealthy, you can buy your way in. You can uh, buy, you know, they have um, uh, different uh, immigration routes. You can, you know, uh, buy or start a business. It has to have a certain capitalization. You have to have a certain number of employees. It's beyond the means of a, a working man like me. I can't move to the States and hire 50 people to buy my way into a green card, you know. But, um, yeah, Hawaii is not, Hawaii would not be my first choice as a gun owner, you know. We'd love to have a patriot like you down here. You'd be a you'd be a great American. And uh, jokingly, I tell you, go to the South border. It's wide open under this administration. Yeah. Come on in. Claim to be Mexican. Do like all the others do and just throw your IDs on the dirt just before you enter the border. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll let you right in. Maybe they'll ship you to Florida because that's where they're shipping a lot of illegal immigrants from Texas. So maybe you can catch one of those planes or those buses oh, to, uh, well, of course, uh, DeSantis is shipping them back up to uh, to uh, Biden's home state, so 
<laughs> now maybe you'll end up there. Who knows? That's but no, funny. we we love to have you. You you are a uh, you're you'd be a great American. Let's say you're a great American now, and uh, we'd love to have families like you down down here in the states. You're very kind, Sam. Thank you. I've always. Um... For what it's worth, you know, I've always thought of myself as philosophically American. I've been saying that for many years. I was actually born on the Fourth of July. Uh, there's just one of uh, one of those, you know, in life. You, 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 if you're paying attention to reality, you see all these strange coincidences. If you're religious, then it's God. If you're not, then it's the universe or it's quantum physics or whatever. But uh, you know, in my life, I've seen all these uh, strange coincidences that, that have told me that it's my fate to one day be an actual American and 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 move to America and live on American soil and. Uh, I, I hope I hope I will one day. You know, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to shoot with you, and I'd love to spend some time with you. That'd be glorious. I love spending time with uh, with people like you, and uh, I'm sure I could learn a bunch from you on the range as well. And it'd be a great time. I'd love having uh, having you for a neighbor. Yeah, thank you. You know, when uh, all this, uh, who knows what what the future will bring? We're kind of living in um, in 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 strange times now. You know, where I've been saying that you know those who love liberty are uh, lovers in a dangerous time right now because we're really under uh, we're getting it from from both flanks up here and uh, it's not clear how it'll end but I like to think that one day you know the way life was five years ago I hope it'll be like that again soon and uh, hopefully our borders open up and you can come up here and shoot with us I'd love for your next appearance on the channel to be shooting out in uh, in the uh, grasslands where I stretch my legs out and uh, and there's no one else I'd rather shoot with uh, than you Sam. Uh, that'd be glorious. We could uh, bring my uh, 300 PRC. You'd have your 300 PRC, and uh, we could test different loads. Uh, get tons of stuff we could do. We'd have a yeah. good old time. That'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait to get that Kdex, and I'll get some load advice from you off camera once uh, once I'm loading for it. Uh, you know, it's I'm excited to to shoot a, a, a 30 caliber Magnum on the channel. That'll be fun. Only thing stopping me is uh, I carry a pistol everywhere I go, so. Might have to get a favor from one of your RNCP, uh, RCMP uh, buddies and see if I can get a special permit to, uh, like, I, I've carried it for uh, 25 years of my adult life. I think I can manage going up there. I promise I won't shoot anyone else unless they're trying to shoot me first, you know, type yeah. thing. It's, it's I don't much, know. It's, I know that's a bureaucratic nightmare and it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Jokingly. I'd of course, happen. yeah. It's, it's totally unreasonable and... Um... You know, uh, and of course, if you're connected to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, then I'm sure you can get uh, an ATC, an authorization to carry. I mean, they have, you know, there was actually a Freedom of Information request a while back uh, demanding to know how many Canadians have ATCs. And I, I kid you not, the official answer was two. Uh, that's that's what I saw on the on the report that someone posted on Facebook. And we know that's impossible because they do give them to trappers and select hunting guides. And, uh, and and people like that, and obviously highly connected people in the in the uh, RCMP brass, not the uh, not the rank and file guys uh, that do all of the, the the that put their lives on the line and do all the hard work that guys like you do. But you know the bureaucrats and the uh, the guys uh, you know connected to the political side of that whole establishment. There's no question they can carry if they want to and. Uh, I, I don't believe for a second that someone like uh, Bill Blair, one of the most unethical police officers who was the subject of uh, an ethics investigation, all the rest of the stuff, they made him Minister of Public Safety under the Trudeau government. And it was him that uh, came in with the, the biggest gun ban in Canadian history last year, May 1st, 2020. They banned something like 1,500 models of firearms, every AR variant. And now they're coming out after handguns. They're basically going after all semi-autos. Oh, and by the way, we have internal passports and, you know, guys like me can't even board a, a domestic flight anymore. So, you know, I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? They're just disarming us while they're stripping away all their civil rights. Uh, you know, I'm sure that's uh, those two things have nothing to do with one another. But I, I'm a father, so, you know, I have to remain positive and believe that, you know, the, the country that I worked to contribute to my whole life, I hope we'll have that again soon and you can come up here and visit and shoot with us, Sam couple of phrases down here it's uh, when tyranny becomes law rebellion becomes duty yeah and uh, you know our origins of our country uh, speak volumes but there's still a lot of people that believe in there you outlaw our guns we're going to be outlaws uh, there are lines that uh, I don't be too bold but uh, I know the government knows that uh, there are there are a certain number of Americans that will not tolerate it I moved out of California for a reason I will not tolerate unconstitutional laws. There's red lines in the sand that that uh, you don't cross or the citizens you're going to get it from. Mm -hmm. They've already had a small taste, but not from our side. They've had it from the rebellious side. Uh, you cross us, well, just look at the gun sales records in America. Yeah. 
You want to see rebellion? Mm -hmm. You mess with law-abiding gun owners in America. We love America. We support our cops and uh, support our military, but uh, we support the Second Amendment as well. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, when I was a cop, uh, we informally talked amongst ourselves and like, what happens if you were given an order to disarm the populace? Well, in every general order for the military and for police, we have a right to refuse an order. That right is based on if the order is immoral, unethical, or un unconstitutional. Uh, get, receiving an order to disarm our populace is unconstitutional. It's also immoral mm -hmm. and unethical, and I would not follow it when I was uh, uh, in the military or when I was a cop. Mm -hmm. There's an organization actually based on that. The liberal media has kind of pinned on uh, your racist type uh, label to them. They're called the Oath Keepers. Mm -hmm. uh, every time we sign up to be a law enforcement officer or in the military, we take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, as an active cop, I didn't want to be uh, associated with that organization because uh, of all the, uh, the slander that's been made against it. And, of course, they've had a few bad apples that have done some bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic premise with, though, I agree. Uh, I support the Constitution. I'm not going to disarm Americans. I'm not going to cordon them and trap them into a certain state like they did in uh, the hurricane in uh, Louisiana. Oh, yeah. Some of the things they did were unconstitutional. They they tried to blame that group on, uh, or they tried to uh, assign some blame or some, some criticism uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, but the biggest example they, they've shown was Hurricane Katrina. That was not during the Obama administration. That was Bush, right? That, that was we, that was during the Bush administration, and we're saying this is a great example of when to refuse an order and when not to execute an order mm -hmm. is when you're giving illegal orders like this when they're confiscating guns yeah. during the middle of a you know natural disaster when people are being robbed and killed. Now you want me to be defenseless in the middle of a natural disaster? So, yeah. So, but personally, I would hope that it would not be, you know, that what's happened in Canada couldn't happen down here. Uh, but I also want to prepare, and I don't want to like, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, you know, hope is not a tactic. Yeah. So that's why we join the NRA, yeah. join UCCA, support these organizations, fight we can, vote Republican, and, uh, you know, do everything we can to prevent it. So, you know, there'd be the cocky person to say, oh, this never happened. This will never happen to us. Well, guess what? There's plenty of people already trying to make it happen, and they're they're not stopping. They're even bolder and open about it these days, and they have ever been in the past. So Democrats used to kind of try and hide like, oh, we're not after your guns. We just want sensible legislation. There's no sensible legislation they want. There's no sensible. Le what do you need a 30 round magazine for? An AR-15 has never been used to defend a house. Oh, shit, it has. The media has suppressed those articles about AR-15s used to defend their households. Pregnant women have used AR-15s to defend their households. There's been plenty of examples of those firearms legally used to defend households and defend their families, but the media suppresses them all because they don't want those examples shown of why we need those firearms. And the most, that you know, the biggest reason that a lot of people don't like to talk about is if our government becomes tyrannical, mm -hmm. we are the only thing standing, you know, in its way of running us over, rounding us up and executing us like they've done in so many countries in the past. And Biden says, well, you're going to need tanks, jets, and other stuff. That's Duly noted. That. Duly noted. That's that's <laughs> him relying on military generals obeying orders to go mm -hmm. and annihilate the civilian populace. How popular popular is that going to be? Oh, you think a general? All the generals are going to obey an order to go annihilate the civilian populace? I don't think so. I think they'll recognize an illegal order. Well, I hope so, you're right, and I hope you're right um, for our sake too. I mean, um, I take uh, nothing for granted. Yeah. That's why I join yeah. in support those organizations. Yeah. I'm vocal about the Second Amendment, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would point to our our founding and are a little bit more adamant. But I, I don't want to take anything for granted, you know. No, for sure. And there I go using the H word. I mean, I hope that uh, that's true of our law enforcement establishment. I suspect it is because uh, my club, uh, we we do have a lot of law enforcement guys. It's uh, it's actually used by the Canada Border Services Agency for their training as well. Uh, which is unfortunate because uh, for them, because it's uh, underwater right now, it was totally destroyed in the floods here in uh, in BC, unfortunately. So our club is uh, going to be rebuilt soon. But uh, the point of this is that, you know, I meet a lot of law enforcement guys at my gun club where I go to shoot pistols. The only place we're allowed to shoot pistols in Canada, unfortunately, is our clubs. And, um, you know, 
it's guys like you. It's really patriotic uh, guys, uh, top drawer guys, and and you know that gives me hope. I don't feel like I don't feel like I'm going to see those guys at my doorstep kicking in my door because I have a pal, because I have a license, and I'm therefore you know I'm on the gun owner registry as it is uh, here in Canada. So. Um, yeah, you know, hope is not a strategy, but um, I hope that uh, most cops are like you, and um, and and I think for the most part, you know, um, the most part, these are among the most patriotic members of our society, and it's uh, if push comes to shove, I think they're on our side, on the side of the people, and um, you know, uh, places like Australia make me worry, no doubt, but um, Canada is a, a bit more American than all that. Uh, to the to the sort of chagrin of, of of Canadian liberals of Canadian progressives, we are pretty American. You know, more more people have firearms licenses, Sam, in Canada than play hockey. Did you know that? No, that's an awesome fact. Awesome that's, statistic. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure a great many more people watch the NHL, but they're not participating in hockey, and that's a very different thing. You know, the you're you're you know you may be a fan if you watch hockey, but you know you can't really claim to be uh, you know a part of Canadian hockey culture if all you do is watch the NHL once a week in the winter time. You know, um, more Canadians have uh, have pals, have firearms licenses than play hockey, like in you know in informal leagues and so forth. So. Uh, that gives me hope. We have a very, very well-armed population. I mentioned a little uh, a nugget to you about Glock uh, marketing a pistol just for Canada, which is the only market they've ever done it for. They made a Canadian version of the 19 uh, uh, with the you know Canadian uh, legal barrel length. So you know we we have a lot of guns in Canada, and I like to think that uh, most cops are like you, and and they're not going to kick in our doors when uh, when the Trudeau regime, because that's what it is at this point. It's it's no longer a government. It's it's a regime, and uh, it's you know it for especially for for a father. You know it is uh, it is getting a bit scary up here. But uh, you know uh, we are doing what we can to prepare in terms of uh, food and water and and community and resilience and all that stuff. We're not giving up shit. You know if if they if they demand uh, our our pistols, for example, then. Um, you know, guys like me are going to mount legal challenges. We're not just going to hand it over because uh, com <clears throat> Comrade Secretary General Trudeau uh, sent someone willing to do it. Hopefully most won't be willing. But um, yeah, uh, we're going to have to wrap, Sam. But thank you so much for joining me, man. It was awesome. I really enjoyed it. And we'll have to do it again. Yes, for sure. I had a great time talking with you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, like I said, you know, if... Uh, if, if uh, if things go as they should, then we'll be shooting one day together. Either I'll come back to Arizona one day. It was, it's a beautiful state. I enjoyed visiting when I was a teenager. I actually hitchhiked from Edmonton in Canada to El Paso, Texas, passing through your state. Had to be an so, adventure. Yeah, it was, it was. I was 18 years old. I had no money, and I wanted to see the world. So that's what you did. You know, uh, my friend and I, we 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 wanted to, you know, see a bit of the world. So that's what we did. And uh, and Arizona is a beautiful state. Uh, you're lucky to live there. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm uh, telling my kids every day, you are blessed to be born into the United States, the greatest country in the face of the world. And, uh, you know, we could have been born other other places and had faced many more adversities. So we're, we're truly blessed. I mean, it, as well, you're blessed to be born in Canada, both peaceful countries, peaceful continents for the most part. So we're, we're truly blessed. Yeah, you come down to Arizona. I'll show you the, uh, I'll take you out to the ranges and we'll have a good time. I'd love to, love to show you about Arizona if you're ever down here. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate your time, and thank you so much for joining us. No problem. God bless you and your family. You guys have a great night. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas, man.